Welcome to Digital Health Talks. Each week, we meet with the healthcare leaders making a measurable difference in equity, access, and quality. Hear about what tech is worth investing in and what isn't as we focus on the innovations that deliver. Join me, Megan Antonelli, and my friend, Shahid Shah, for our weekly No BS Deep Dives into what's really making an impact in healthcare. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Health Impact. This is Megan Antonelli, and I am so excited to be here with an old friend. I think we met back in Chicago at a Health Impact Midwest years and years ago, Dr. Jay Bott. Jay is a practicing physician, a primary care, and a public health innovator and instructor at the University of Illinois at the Chicago School of Public Health. And he has recently co-authored a book with Dr. Abba Agrawal. We're here to talk to him about that, as well as his work in healthcare innovation and what he's seeing in trends. Hi, Jay. Hi, Megan. It's wonderful to be with you. And I uh, really appreciate the time we have to talk about this really important issue of patient safety. And thanks for lifting up this conversation. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, when you think back in terms of all of the innovation and work that's been done in this space that really all started with patient safety, right? I mean, yeah, um, it's patient safety has been pride and true to, over the years. And I think COVID illuminated that it's even more important. And there are more tools now than we had before to address it. And we've made progress, but not nearly the progress we need to make uh, on this issue. And the work of experts over the last two decades has shown that the problems um, of medical errors patient safety as a challenge is continue to be an important issue. And it's the opportunity of well-intentioned people trying to do the right thing, but our systems are not reliable. And uh, there is ways that we can approach health, both quality and safety from a system view that can help us lead to better health outcomes and, uh, and minimize adverse events. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the book. I know it's the second edition of Patient Safety, a Case-Based Innovative Playbook for Safer Care, correct? So tell us a little bit about the book and then kind of what the aim behind it is. I'm uh, honored to uh, be an editor on this book with my colleague and friend, Dr. Abba Agarwal. She has been a medical executive for many years in New York and Chicago and as an informaticist and uh very much driven by improving quality and safety. And so she uh, helped pull together the first edition. We built on that, this edition, that edition with the second one that we're just releasing. And the book aims to serve as a playbook and guide for the creation of a safer healthcare system in this environment and moment, building on the new technologies, tools, building on our knowledge in quality and safety, and building on what we learned through the pandemic. And this book would not have been possible and wouldn't be available today if it wasn't for the expertise, the commitment, the work of so many authors of the chapters uh, that reflect the issues that are important in patient safety today. And so I'm just so grateful to my colleagues and, and friends that have contributed to the second edition and offered their views. Uh, and these are from healthcare leaders, accomplished practitioners, and experts in patient safety. And so we talk about uh, some of the same issues that are tried and true, the national patient safety goals that have been illuminated um, uh, by the Joint Commission and, and others, the Agency for Healthcare Quality Research, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, uh, the National Foundation for Patient Safety, and many others. But what this book uh, provides is a, a, a new vision of patient safety in this decade uh, to come. And what changes need to fall into place between now and the next decade to have this future of high quality, affordable, equitable care realized. And so we offer this uh, book as a case-based approach because we want uh, the community to learn from these cases in which uh, you can see the opportunities to make different decisions or learn from what uh, unfortunately may have happened in uh, the course of adverse events. And we look at the most common types of medical errors and to help readers learn the key clinical organizational and system issues in patient safety. And do you remember, Megan, in the, in the late 90s, there is human. It's a report from the National Academy of Medicine, Institute of Medicine, that really spoke to the number of medical errors, nearly 100,000 uh, a year that we have in this country. And so we've made, again, progress, but uh, a lot more 
to do. And, and if we look across the world, the, that number is at nearly 3 million. Yeah, no, it is. And I think the approach of a case base, having the examples, having learning from the mistakes that are made, right? I mean, or sort of the various situations. Are there yeah. some examples in there that you think are particularly notable? Sure. I, so we break the book up into uh, several sections. One, the foundation, which is high reliability, health equity, which is a key aspect of patient safety. Quality and equity are two sides of the same coin. Uh, you can't have one without the other. And in order to have high quality health care, health equity has to be a part of it. And it's certainly been further illuminated through the course of the last several years. The culture of safety is foundational. We talk about through the view of the work of the Hospital Improvement Innovation Network nationally. And uh, as I was former chief medical officer of the American Hospital Association, led the nation's largest hospital improvement innovation network with 34 states and nearly 1,700 hospitals to reduce adverse events by 20%, readmissions by 12%. To talk about some of the lessons from that. Human factors and patient safety, again, a view of reliability, but builds on that and I think so important about design and intention and how we help minimize human error. And COVID-19 and patient safety, uh, we talk about as well. And then you talk about a number of different traditional concepts of transitions, teamwork and communication, patient identification, the use of the electronic health record as a tool to help advance patient safety, and then the myriad of clinical ethics issues that emerge in the work of quality and safety. And then we talk about clinical scenarios that are common errors that we've seen over the years, medication error, wrong site surgery, hospital acquired infections, which are more the adverse events, falls, diagnostic error, which is emerged as a really important issue over the course of the years and about reframe as diagnostic excellence and then opioid safety. And then we go through special considerations through various disciplines in medicine and what patient safety looks like in pediatrics or in anesthesia or in mental health or oh, wow, yeah. outpatient care and emergency department. And then also give an international view of this. What are the issues globally around uh, patient safety? And then we talk about kind of the moral injury and communication and resolution as organizational issues to address. So really excited about the examples and the cases that come through here. But the bottom line is there's something to learn from each case that you can apply in your day-to-day -day practice. And this is also a great resource for educators that are trying to illustrate and teach around quality and safety. Yeah. Well, you talk a little bit about in terms of the equity and patient safety and how they're two sides of the same coin and stuff. And I think nothing was more apparent during the pandemic and so much was learned from that. Are there some specifics in terms of kind of key takeaways organizations can do? I mean, obviously there's that culture of equity and the culture of patient safety. And how do you make sure that they're both kind of aligned to support each other? Yeah, one, what we've seen been effective is a credible, measurable strategy for health equity that's integrated across the organization. And if we just take quality and safety, the focus of this book, looking at approaches like asking questions, what is the difference between men and women when it comes to diabetes readmissions? And that data largely is available. And so one uh, organization had a 10% difference of women were getting readmitted more than men for diabetes. And so then you dig into uh, the various reasons, try to isolate them, interrogate your data, and then have a, a plan for intervention and reliability and teaching approaches and consistency, and then incentivizing it across the organization at an enterprise level and recognizing and celebrating it. And so with that, over three years, the number went to zero. We talk about we can get to zero, a million transfusions without a mismatch or three years without a catheter-based infection. Those are uh, inequity, zero is possible as well. The zero gaps, zero health gaps. And so that's one example. The other is the approach to looking at your population and the notion of observe versus expected ratios and what is expected of the population and community, the dominant population versus the observed of the population group segment that's marginalized historically. And you can cut your metrics that way and see. The other is longitudinal view of data over several years as opposed to just one year, because you can see that it, consistency with treatment on medicines may drop off after a year in certain populations. So those are some opportunities, but it starts with 
a strategy, a plan, and, and consistently asking the question and thinking about our sexual orientation, gender identity, and racial ethnic minority data. Then I would say the other thing that came up is language. Some places have now incorporated translation, language translation into their safety huddle so that you're also engaging in a conversation about are we supporting people who speak different languages effectively so that we're minimizing adverse events and error. Right. Which, of course, is becoming a little bit easier and more possible with some of the technology that's out yeah. there. So a lot of our audience is technology focused and innovation focused. And so I think it's interesting that obviously patient safety, which has been sort of the bellwether topic and, and initiative around innovation and technology implementation for how you for the for how you justify the the costs and investment in that space. But of course, as the time goes on, some of the innovations have maybe had less impact than others. What are your thoughts on kind of maybe where some of the original technologies are in terms of doing their job with patient safety? But also, let's also think, I'd love to hear your thoughts on some of the new technologies and what their role, like AI, will be in either helping or what we need to worry about with respect to um, equity and patient safety for, for either of those. Yeah. I think that there are many instances in which low-tech tools can help address patient safety. One of the initiatives I was proud to be a part of was the Age-Friendly Health Systems Initiative launched by the John A. Hartford Foundation, Institute for Healthcare Improvement, Catholic Health Association, American Hospital Association, which now is in over 3,500 sites of care of this model of the four M's, where you look at the issues of what matters to patients, patient family preferences, and that's really the anchor then medication management, mobility, and mentation. And all four of those have to be deployed as a bundle. And one of the interesting stories heard from one organization was that they were seeing dehydration and decline in older adults on a unit. And one of the challenges was that this patients couldn't actually drink from their jug or their cup effectively to hydrate. And so as a result, we're then having delirium because of the dehydration. And so what well, had an outcome that uh, wasn't the best. And so by understanding that and reusing a different kind of approach with a straw and a jug and making it easier for them to have hydration, reduced uh, delirium by a significant percentage. And so yeah. that is a low tech way. The other is our EHRs with order sets and alerts. Those are all ways that we've been using it, remote monitoring. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, that we think about is low value alerts for organizations to evaluate what are high value alerts versus low value alerts and getting rid of low value alerts gives time back. Uh, and when you ask patients what quality means for them, and, and we learned this from Anne Arundel, one of our pioneer systems in age friendly, in the age friendly health system movement was that it was time back for patients to do the things that mattered to them and for people that depended and for those that depended on them. So I think there's a lot of work that we can do using existing technologies from digital to remote to things that offer alerts to even the procedures uh, that are technology driven. We're seeing uh, more uh, use of uh, non-invasive approaches to address conditions, even continuous glucose monitoring, which is such an important area that's not covered by a number of insurance providers, both public and commercial. So that's things that we've done in the past and here over the last several years that I've seen make a difference. The issue of AI um, has advanced patient safety by helping interrogate data to produce insights, improve decision-making, and uh, be able to predict uh, where to intervene and prioritize. So um, predicting sepsis deterioration, error detection, stratifying patients and managing you know, the use of medications. Those are all ways that AIs can be used. And predictive AI, different than generative AI. Uh, generative AI, I don't know that it's ready for prime time clinically, but can help us around summarizing uh, and in, in querying large swaths of data to identify test results or other key areas or summarize what the current state of a condition is in the continuum of treatment, a diagnosis and treatment for a patient prior authorization. Those are some administrative burdens that are impacting workforce well-being 
is another one. The other is not imaging where we've seen AI play an important role and, and try to identify nodules in the lung or other cancers early on that can be intervened on. So right. early warning signs. Area. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think that's an important distinction in terms of the predictive AI versus generative AI and that the predictive AI aims can potentially reduce some time and burden and, and time to diagnosis and things like that. Um, but if anything, create hopefully create redundancy to avoid error of missed diagnosis to some degree, whereas the generative AI isn't really ready for prime time with respect to clinical. So while we can sort of cite and see how errors could pre be presented if generative AI is the tool we're talking about. But what about on the equity side? I know that may, that might not be a patient safety discussion, but have you in your work now and are you working on things with respect to AI and equity and the ethics initiatives around that? Yeah, I think that there's the importance of trustworthy and ethical AI and technology. And so having governance, monitoring, testing of algorithms, we know that there's data evidence that suggests that there's bias in clinical algorithms that are embedded in AI. And so I think this is really an important area. That being said, AI also has the opportunity to help address health inequities by helping identify high risk individuals or when people's risk is dynamic. And so understanding com the combination of what needs might be most impacted and needed by patients from a social needs standpoint as well. Then you have community health navigators, care navigators intervene on that and similar warning signs, early detection, and then also being able to offer technology that allows behavior change and decision-making and helping um, historically vulnerable underserved communities be able to access better health. We also have to be mindful of diagnostics that aren't uh, meeting the needs of people of color. For example, the pulse ox and readings that might have been inaccurate for certain populations. We also see that there are ways to use virtual and digital tools to help people manage their health. But I also think from a mental health standpoint, it can be important, but we've got to be mindful of some of the bias and then addressing misinformation and disinformation that may be part of it. And, and the last thing I'll say is our, the point of view, artificial intelligence is an enabler and it will enhance the work you do. And so those that know how to understand how to use it and build capability and understanding with it will have an advantage in order right. to be able to address. Yeah, I mean, I think when we've done lots of work and research around social determinants of health and been talking about it for so long, but it's such a, there's so much data and so much information to bring in that at least at some point when they, when we're able to really leverage AI to bring in that information to make decisions or help with decisions and help identify potential risks, then we'll be able to actually realize the, the power of that data. So you sit in a very unique place in terms of practicing, but also teaching and then working even often with employers and with many different organizations within healthcare. And so I'd love your perspective, especially kind of going back from when American Hospital Association to now where there's been a lot of change, but uh, the pandemic certainly brought forward the importance of public health, right? And where that fits in. And I think even with patient safety, it's an interesting discussion because sometimes it does hit on that sort of public health discussion versus everyday practice and, and where a hospital is making decisions. Where do you think we are in terms of that intersection of and that interplay between public health and, and health care? And have we come far enough and how much further do we have to go? Yeah, I think uh, my view is that we've made uh, some progress or good examples of how the community health needs assessment is being used as a convening tool and an intelligence for a community health strategy to address the needs and co-create needs of a community and co-create with the community. I think there were some great bright spots in terms of how healthcare and public health work together during COVID. I think we've got to scale an approach and set of approaches for public health, healthcare delivery, and community-based organizations to work together in care models that incorporate those collaborations and then have a payment model that supports it. So we're seeing some deployment, various models that are being tested that may be able to do that. And I think there's a renewed sense of accelerating this work. I may have seen Kaiser Permanente launched a collaborative with a number of associations called the Common Health Coalition that is really focused on exactly this, the intersection between public health, healthcare delivery and community-based organizations 
to advance uh, health in America. So I'm really excited about a number of different efforts in this arena. And we're seeing some regulatory tailwinds from the Joint Commission, identifying health equity as a national patient safety goal, the NCQA accreditation for health equity for payer, to the work around clinical trial diversity in government and across the industry, and the work of new care models that are incorporating equity, and then population-specific kind of products to serve the LGBTQIA plus population or Black women or Latino community and diabetes. So I think all of those require collaboration. We know the health equity is everybody's business and that it's not a side gig or side hustle, but that it's got to be thought about within the strategic operational financial work. And most importantly, we in quality and safety so that we deliver the highest quality, affordable, equitable care to our patients, families, and communities. Absolutely. Well, that is where we want to be for sure. And you're doing a lot of work in that space to make it happen. So thank you so much for your time. Tell us again where we can get the book and uh, the title. Thank you, Megan. The book, we're really excited about it. Abba and I spent several years playing together. You can find it on Amazon. Its uh, title is Patient Safety, a Case-Based Innovative Playbook for Safer Care. And I know that the first edition was in libraries around the country and world, and we hope that this one will be as well, published by Springer. Yes, no doubt. Well, thanks again. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Hopefully we'll see you soon at uh, a Health Impact or maybe at Node Health Digital Medicine Conference and keep it up. And I look forward to, to uh, getting the book, seeing the book and uh, reading it and then um, sharing uh, more with our audience. Thanks, Megan. I really appreciate your leadership and work in this space and, and all that you're doing with Node Health and Health Impact and look forward to seeing you in those venues. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this week's Health Impact's Digital Health Talk. Don't miss another podcast. Subscribe at digitalhealthtalks.com. And to join us at our next face-to-face event, visit healthimpactlive.com.